that reciprocity is another part of that neural exercise. So play has this movement and inhibition of movement, which is a neural exercise. It has reciprocity and it has face-to-face -face interactions. And when you don't have face-to-face, -face, you use, at least humans use, intonation of their voice. Well, hi, Dr. Porges. Thank you so much for being a part of our third annual Innovative Child Therapy Symposium. I love your work. I love everything that I've learned from you and Deb Dana specifically. It's a, a huge part of my work, my consultation, my training as a registered play therapist and also an EMDR therapist. So I know today we're going to talk about the term play, which can be used um, a few different ways. So we're going to talk about what it really means in terms of like polyvagal theory. But before we do that, let me have you just introduce yourself. Tell people who you are. Okay. And what you do. Obviously, I'm Stephen Porges. I'm uh, I uh, I'm the founding director of the Traumatic Stress Research Consortium at the Kinsey Institute at Indiana University. I hold the position of distinguished university scientist there. I'm a professor of psychiatry at the University of North Carolina. Um, I have a, a long, I would say, uh, decades uh, of uh, being an academic. That's my identity as being a laboratory researcher who found interest in the applied and clinical world and trying to translate ideas from the polyvagal theory, which I developed over decades of work as well, and really have been working on translating those principles into practical applications, whether we're talking about play therapy, education, medicine, and even just playing good life with our spouses and friends, yes. uh, polyvagal principles are embedded in that because what we start learning is that we evolve to be a social organism. And mm. that's really what our quest in life is to be, is sociality. And in fact, we can say with polyvagal theory, sociality becomes a neuromodulator. So it's like neurostimulation to our system. So we have to elevate it and not in a sense, uh, uh, th neglected. And this is where play has really uh, been mistreated because it is an important part of being social. It's an important part of co-regulation. And by the way, thank you for mentioning Deb's work. And Deb, Deb is actually a person who gave language to the clinical world mm -hmm. for polyvagal theory. And uh, uh, Deb is a very remarkable person who both, you know, I would say intuitively, but understood it and then took the principles and created a language of communication. So I really have very positive and warm feelings for Deb. Oh, yes. Oh, that's amazing. And when you said that you're describing her and you say positive and warm feeling, I actually felt mm. it in my chest mm. in a little bit of like, a, like I could easily lean into a little bit tearing mm. up thinking about yeah. because I've seen her work change my clients lives change yeah. my life your work it's incredible yeah. well what Deb does is she's able to take you know I would say the principles that I understood and uh, implement them in a way that other people's bodies understand the principles so the the basic underlying theme within polyvagal theory is that your physiological state your autonomic state plays an important role and you can't expect uh good social behavior, good cognitive function, if your physiology is in a state of threat. So mm -hmm. you're not going to convince the brain to uh, uh, rein in all these oppositional behaviors, disorganized behaviors, mm -hmm. when those oppositional and disorganized behaviors 
are functionally an attempt to deal with a threatening situation. Yes. The body feels a state of threat. So it's not the events, really. It's how the body feels. And Deb's been really remarkable on that and in communicating that. And Deb's in this very small class of people that I call super co-regulators. And that yeah. is uh, when you are engaged with them, your body becomes accessible and here's here's the parallel deb talks about ventral vagal side, but what you're really also doing is your ventral side is becoming open and when mm. someone is tense or scared or defensive they close the ventral side and you can think about your pets your dog or your cat when they are trusting and feeling safe they're showing their ventral side and, you know, so you can just look at people and see how they sit and if they're pulling themselves together. And in the world of play therapy, which is really focusing primarily with children, but it really shouldn't, um, mm -hmm. is yeah. really <clears throat> trying to move children from <clears throat> states of fear into states of social engagement. Yes. Gosh, when you talk about like a, a dog, I'm thinking they give you their belly. That's where all their internal organs are. I um I, I listen to your book and her books like on Audible as I'm walking around the block. And I think I, I told you right before we start recording that it was raining this morning. I was walking in the rain and um, she um, and what I just listened to was like um, be uh, safe in your body and in your mm -hmm. environment and in your relationship. And those three things I, I've heard you say too, I can't remember, I've listened to so many things of yours, but um, feel safe in the arms of others, whether it's quite literally or I, I, I think that's the goal in life. That's, I use it that way. I think the goal, our goal or quest in life is to feel safe enough in the arms of another. We mm -hmm. want to feel safe in that. And so even individuals who carry severe trauma histories with them and can't be in proximity, someone touches them and they recoil. Yes. Still, their mental image in their dream of what they want is to feel safe enough in the arms of another. So it's a really, it's part of our quest as a human species, and that is to feel safe in the arms of another. And again, culture really plays, uh, does nasty tricks with these needs that are built into our nervous system. It says that if you need that, you're dependent on someone and you're not strong. So we start, in a sense, treating people uh, who are really trying to express, express their humanity yeah. as if they are weak and haven't really succeeded. Uh, we learn, we learn, actually, what I always like to say is I've learned so much about being a human from those who have suffered severe trauma, mm. because they will tell you what they've lost. Oh. And suddenly you start to understand that when your body shifts into a chronic state of threat or defense, these attributes of co-regulating and connecting with another are greatly challenged. Oh, that's the being with, like, I think of like uh, Dr. Siegel's and we, the being mm -hmm. with sometimes is really hard for people um, when they've, when they've experienced complex trauma or any trauma. Yeah. So my, I, I would really be really cautious about utilizing certain words, because when we use the word safe, we start saying, well, I am safe, but what are you talking about? Or yeah. the issue is safety is a feeling. And it's a feeling that's also linked to the ability to connect and be in proximity with another. It's safety and trust actually are intertwined. Our society talks about safe worlds and we try to remove guns and knives and uh, bombs and things like that. But that's in a sense, I'm not saying it's bad to get take care of that, get that out of the way, but that's not enough. Uh -huh. Our nervous system is there literally uh, I was about to say crying, but really clamoring for uh, cues of safety and trust. You know, wanting is as a nervous system wanting to befriend is who we really are. We oh, want to befriend. So That's so good. And when you say it's not enough to just take away the, yeah. the I'm thinking like I, I was literally pulling on uh, some of the things I've learned from you uh, yesterday. Um, a lot of the kids that we were working with, um, they have a lot of cues of danger, whether it's the news is on in the morning before mm -hmm. they go to school or there's still, um, you know, a lot of things that are cues of danger in their life, but there's not that addition of um, cues of safety. 
Well, let's even, you know, kind of discuss this from a child's perspective. Yeah. Walking into the classroom or the school can be frightening to a child who's been bullied. And the, and the parent has their own needs. They might have to get off to work or they have something else they're important to do. They have responsibilities. And they, in a sense, even though they love their child, they want their child out. <laughs> you know, it's out. Go, go, I got to go. Got right. And so if the child says, oh, it hurts in my stomach, which is just waving a flag yeah. that their body's under a state of threat. And the parent will say, oh, don't worry about it. You'll be fine. You'll get over that. Or they say that, you know, I really have these feelings and they don't have the words initially like I'm anxious or I'm scared. You know, it's feelings and the feelings are overwhelming because they start to immobilize the child. Child loses that spontaneity and exuberance. Yeah. And the parent says, don't worry about it. Yeah, dismisses them. Like yeah. it. And this is the journey to numbness, which is uh -huh. really part of our, I would say, uh, traumatized society or threatened society. Mm -hmm. And that is, if it bothers you, it's your problem. It doesn't bother me. And so we, we have to really acknowledge that something that may not bother me, honestly may not bother me, might yeah. bother you. It might really be really disruptive you but it's real it's sincere and you were getting back to dan siegel's stuff and i was really wanted to say that our goal in life another goal other than quote connecting and co-regulating part of that is to be a good witness yeah to listen to another without uh dismissing it or trying to fix it now the parent the teacher wants to uh fix it yeah. take the person out but the nervous system wants to express the feelings of disruption it mm -hmm. wants to say how do i feel mm -hmm. and not saying oh that's nothing and it bothers you i'll fix it i'll take you to a psychiatrist mm -hmm. i'll take you to this mm -hmm. i'll get medication or you know all these types of strategies and yeah. that's not what uh, the nervous system wants it doesn't matter if it's a child a friend a spouse uh, a student um, the nervous system wants to be heard. Yes. Oh, my goodness. I think about how you say about everything's an adaptation and even mm. how the different states of the autonomic nervous system, there's not a bad or good one. They just are and they serve different functions. Yeah. Well, what we have to realize is how easy it is for our nervous system to shift states from a state that's calm and engaging to be triggered, literally to be defensive but defensive is not just defensive behavior, defensive thoughts. It's a defensive physiology. And uh -huh. that physiology makes it hard to reconnect. So it mobilizes, it creates uh, uh, fight-flight strategies. And if it becomes overwhelming, which is the situation with children, yeah. not just in the day-to-day -day life, but even in terms of medical procedures. So in the world of play therapy, some of the children come are rehabilitating from medical surgeries, you know, yes. that whole area, because the child's been totally overwhelmed and uh -huh. functionally shut down. Yes. And it's a different defensive strategy. It's not fight flight. It's shutting down. It's basically, uh, I use the word neuroception because the nervous system makes that judgment that if you can, it says uh, fight or flee, you fight or flee. But if you're overwhelmed, disappear, shut down. Yes. And this is what often happens in medical procedures. But the, I would say the uh, world that we live in, I don't know where they got their, their language basically says, uh, all these defensive behaviors are self-determined, meaning that we determine, we select, uh, we have agency over them without really understanding that so much of our behavior is adaptively reflexive yeah. for good reason for our survival. And so that when we have cues of threat, we may react with a threat, you know, threat-like behavior. We may start perceiving the world as being very negative. And this is mm -hmm. what happens. You're all out to get me. And what we end up doing is generating higher brain structures, using those to create narratives that justify why we feel that way. Mm -hmm. as, so, and that's where this numbness goes. So we justify the feelings as opposed to kind of understanding the feelings and understanding them from this evolutionarily adaptive one. So this is part of what it is to be a human. A cue of danger, I'm going to be mobilized. But a cue of safety and trust, I'll give it up. 
And so we need that type of neural exercise of moving back and forth from those states. Oh, I love that. I love that. When you said um, about the medical trauma, I'm thinking about, I I pull from your knowledge so much, but predictability and familiarity, yeah. mm-hmm. can be cues of safety. Um, the little boy, um, my mom gave me permission to talk about um, his uh, story, uh, had uh, brain surgery. Uh, it was like two and a half years old in the beeping sound and um, just the, the, uh, the highlights and everything, very triggering the neuroception mm-hmm felt since he didn't have the words to say this is overwhelming or I can't stand this or the it was more of like a intense uh just a reaction in this body yeah. but knowing what you taught us about familiarity and predictability mm-hmm. mom brought in a mask um the um and she actually put like a little candy through it so he, you know he could feel it and play with it mm-hmm. and then she had pictures of the um of the an operating in typical operating mm-hmm. room and then we could listen to the sounds or imagine the sounds so that when he had his doctor's appointment it was then familiar and predictable mm-hmm. and it brought that neuroception to yeah. perception is that how you would say well it, it is as the it changes the thresholds of, of what neuroception, in a sense, will go to a Dan Siegel one. It, it widens the window of tolerance. Mm. So he has, you know, much, when you're, in a sense, under a state of threat, that window of tolerance, you may appear to be calm for a moment, and then you're going to jump out of your skin. Yeah. I, I am, what you're describing is, in a sense, the parallel with adults is visualization uh, tapes or discs where you listen to uh, what what surgery is about and people are going to be helping you and trying to utilize a top-down visualization Mm -hmm. to keep the body under control. Mm -hmm. And it's quite effective uh, if you have, in fact, uh, with even with children, they're, if they have positive images of being a child, now this is where it gets really into that other area. But if you're as a child have wonderful uh, memories like uh, going to an amusement park or having a birthday or being hugged or some positive thing, that type of visual image is helpful for a child going into the uncertainty, just like it is for an adult who's going into surgery to visualize their loved ones and have a smile on their face, thinking of their granddaughter or their wife or positive experiences in their life. It's because those top-down shift uh, physiological state. And as long as we have uh, images and feelings of positivity, Mm -hmm. we are biased not to react in threat. Oh, so good. So I'm thinking that safety coupled with those images gives, yeah. is it like an anchor that keeps Well, them- Deb would use the word anchor. I used, would use the word resource. And mm-hmm. what we end up doing is kind of like getting an inventory of what our resources are. Um, I mean, as an adult, we can talk this way, but as a developing adult, we wouldn't. As a child, we certainly wouldn't. But we would say, you know, um, I'm really thin on my resource. <laughs> you know, you'd say like, I've been up every night, I've been doing this work. Uh, my resilience uh, doesn't have enough ballast to deal with the intervention, this thing like surgery. So what are we really saying? Your body needs to go into uh, training or rehabilitation before surgery, not after. And, uh, so, so, so for my, for my, uh, I had uh, surgery a few years ago and I went into training. I started exercising every day and I, then I did visualization tapes. And the product of that was really when I was wheeled into the operating room without preoperative uh, medic sedation or medication. And I am in this kind of dialogue. I'm on the slab getting ready for surgery. And I say to the anesthesiologist, I say, it's your responsibility to keep me alive. And before he could respond, and the reason I said that is because I have, I've done work in anesthesiology and my anesthesiologist friends always say that's their responsibility. So I was in a sense, small talking with them. Yeah. But be- before he could even respond, the scrub nurse who was down by my feet uh, said, no, it's all our jobs. And this is actually script from the visualizations. You're, there's a team of people working to save you and help you. Yeah. And I said, okay, what's my heart rate? So, you know, this is early morning on the slab and it was in the low 60s. And, and I said, 
I said, okay, let's go. And they put the mask on and I was gone. Uh, the issue was, I mean, I wasn't going to click my heels like Dorothy. And you know. <laughs> <laughs> So the issue is there's no way out. You have to do this because if you get out of it today, they'll do it tomorrow. Yeah. It's a process that has to occur. And that is kind of a visualization to you need to have this done. So it's a psychology that has a physiology of yeah. welcoming an intervention and even an intervention, which is barbaric, they're going to cut you open. Yes. And, and they're going to cut you open and your body can respond to that incision as if you're being eviscerated or someone's trying to help you. And the setting conditions that I was trying to go through was this welcoming. Mm -hmm. And within, we created this, the Polyvagal Institute to try to embed the principles through educational uh, uh, procedures into various disciplines. And we're working with physicians and the idea with that, with the physicians, is how do you recruit the patient's nervous system to be a collaborator on a shared journey towards oh. health? Oh, that's so And so, so, it, so it's, it, it's all this interactive bit that you leverage through concepts of human-to-human -human trust that change your physiology to allow your physiology to be welcoming to things that it would really, you know, on the surface be barbaric. Oh, and if your heart rate was 60, that suggests that you were feeling safe as you looked at the doctor, as you looked at the team that you had already prepared for long before the surgery. Yeah. And, and there was a transformation in my physiology because as a, uh, let's say, an intense academic for decades, I didn't exercise. You know, I play with my kids occasionally. Mm -hmm. I played basketball on the weekends occasionally and bike ride on weekends occasionally, but I didn't systematically exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, but I started to systematically exercise and I still, I still exercise a lot now because uh, when you're younger, the body has this, it's more flexibility. But yes. what I'm really saying is my physiology started to get a different level of resilience. And so I had mm -hmm. better neural resources to move among my, the states. And so I was as, as physically in very good shape for any type of surgical procedure. Oh. And, and basically it was interesting is that uh, I was walking up flights of steps and this was an abdominal surgery uh, in a day. So uh, oh my goodness. And I was robotic, but there were no scars. So, the, you know, since wow. everything healed right. And, you know, it was basically the body was receptive mm. for, the, for the surgery. Because you took care of it, probably knowing that was a cue of safety in itself. Okay, two things are coming to mind. It's like my mind is like exploding with all of this, like associations. Gottman method. Um, I do Gottman method uh, sessions and we use the uh, pulsometers on the fingers. And then when that gets to over a hundred, then we pause and we regulate. Mm -hmm. And also Peter Levine's polar bear video. You know, have you seen that where he has like this polar bear video and at the end it shows um, it, it says uh, polar bear not getting traumatized. It shows like tranquil, it gets tranquilized and they do some inspections of its paw and then it starts to shake. I'm thinking it's mobilized and it's in the sympathetic and then it takes this big like, <sighs> like a big breath out and then the people go away, of course, and then the bear just kind of um, leaves and it has all that um, kind of that flowing through the states and it it's not getting it, it would, Peter would talk, shakes it off. And yes. he does it with the gazelle and, and these other, uh, not the good. Um, oh, yeah, I've seen the, that. Yeah, yeah the, 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 the other African animals, um, they shake it off. That's in a sense of going out of, from a dorsal to a sympathetic and then to yeah. a more hybrid socialized where they go back to their herd and troop. They're moving, but they're engaging. And the, the answer is to that the sympathetic plays this important role in neutralizing the immobilization. And with people with severe trauma, what we realize is that they, many of them don't want to sit still because it's too close to that immobilization vulnerability. Yes. So they gravitate towards risky behaviors and including children, you see this as well. Yes, we dance a lot in play therapy, which yeah. is fun. I've been doing EMDR sessions on the beach and using the walking for the bilateral. Uh -huh. 
fascinating. The level of disturbance mm. drops. I mean, I'm just throwing a number out. Of course, I don't have anything kind of quantifiable, but it seems like twice as fast. Um, we're actually walking mm. barefoot in the water yeah. and, um, you know, amidst all of that nature in mm. setting up the, the target with the image mm. and the sensations and the emotions and everything. And um, it's just incredible with the movement. We'll walk for two hours, one hour there, one hour back. By the time something that was very distressing to them no longer has a level of disturbance anywhere in the body. It's yeah, fascinating. That, that's wonderful. I, I'm a firm believer that if you carry with you a lot of adversity history, which is really what you're talking about, the point of entry is through movement because movement is already protecting you from that deep immobilization threat. And then if you can start superimposing on the movement, the social engagement aspect, and you create this in a sense play. I call play when you have your social engagement system and your sympathetic system working together. Mm. Play is dance. It's you know it, it's but it's not play. See the I mean, this is where we have to go for a moment. Okay. Yeah. The, the problem play. the problem with play is that the word has been co opted and misunderstood uh, because it's commercial, and so we sell products that are for play, which tend to be solitary play. And our nervous system like really playing on up. a device or something. Yes, yes, and it's a way of quote self-regulating. Mm -hmm. uh, it keeps children quiet, but it doesn't develop the neural skills of mm -hmm. co-regulation. But play is co-regulation in a sense. Mm -hmm. Play with another, so team sports, interactive with another, is extremely important. Um, if if you watch kittens or puppies, or you know they they do interactive play, and what are they doing? They're maintaining face to face contact, regardless of what other behavior they're doing. So even when dogs chase each other, they're not face to face. But when they one catches the other, that's a light bite to the rear leg. I got you. It's a tag. Yeah. And then the one that gets caught turns the head to look at the eyes and face of the dog that caught him to make sure that the behavior wasn't aggressive, oh. but was playful. And they lock and then they roll reverse. The dog okay. that was chasing becomes the one that's chased. That reciprocity is another part of that neural exercise. So play has this movement and inhibition of movement, which is a neural exercise. It has reciprocity and it has face-to-face -face interactions. And when you don't have face-to-face, -face, you use, at least humans use, intonation of their voice. So mm -hmm. they're, and so with team sports, you're not necessarily looking at your, your colleagues, your, but you're utilizing your voice. And the vocalization, the intonation of the vocalization contains and conveys whether things are safe or not safe. Oh, that's so good. And I think about like as child therapists, we are working with parents and we're talking about the importance of voice. And I know um, Deb Dana calls it vocal burst. Um, but even like the, the I, I love your the, even the terms, I call them games of reciprocity, the turn taking my turn, your turn, my turn, your turn. And since I have learned about the polyvagal theory, I have literally told every parent get at least two games of reciprocity. I don't mm -hmm. even know if that even makes sense. It does in my mind though. Two games of reciprocity in your household and play as frequently as you can, um, at least once or twice a week. So whether it's Jenga or whether it's Connect yeah. Four or whether mm -hmm. it's um, Uno, I love mm -hmm. Uno, something that's like back and forth. Well, what you're bringing up is actually the history of board games, which were in a sense family or group interactions, versus the modern era of Game Boy and uh, uh, you know solitary uh, what they call it? Uh, game game box. You know where okay. you you may play by yourself or you may play with someone not in real time even. So you okay. lose the reciprocity. So we're giving up a lot with what we think we got all these innovations, but they're really interfering with the neural development of our nervous system. We need reciprocity. Yeah. What well, makes me think of, um, oh, I'm thinking of that still face video. And I know a lot yeah. of people watching this have seen that. Um, you could see it very much with a, a young, young child, how mm. that, that interaction is so important for the brain development. 
Now, before we just finish just, up- just hang on that one, because we just published a paper looking at the uh, acoustic features of the mother's voice after the still face mm. and the baby's heart rate and behavior. And, you know, when the baby mother does the still face for two minutes, the babies get disrupted. And then there's a reunion where the mother talks to the baby and calms the baby. Uh, if the mother's voice is more prosodic, meaning more intonation, the baby's heart rates go down a lot. If the baby mm-hmm. mother's voice lacks that prosody, the heart rate doesn't go down at all. Yeah. Wow. And, and, and we're also looking at the actual behaviors. Behaviors are in terms of uh, behavioral, behavioral calming is also very much linked to the intonation of the mother's voice. So we're actually seeing in real time the effectiveness of that uh, let's say non-gesture vocalization channel as conveying, I would say, distilled cues of safety and trust, more prosodic voice, safer wow. person. Like that sing song, that flow that goes with it. I know I show that video and a- every time I do an MDR with kids training with clinicians, mm-hmm. at least one person cries at least one clinician cries and sometimes that person's me, but I used to do, I don't do this anymore, but I was at Dr. Siegel at one of his conferences, and he has the, um, no, no, say it seven times. And it really drives the point home, but there's a huge dysregulation in the repair, especially if you do it at the beginning of your talk, People don't trust you, even though they know that you're no. illustrating something. Mm. The power of the intonation of voice being very threatening, very mm. danger, they tune out. Sometimes they'll yeah. leave the room. Mm. I don't blame them. Well, it, it's powerful because for those that leave the room, what it, it's such a powerful trigger and it pre- yes. probably brings back uh, childhood abuse yes. um, and not being witnessed, not being listened to. And so there's a a trigger of being dissociated or being minimized, marginalized, but also dissociated. Um, so it's it's both the physical uh, dismissiveness and separation, but it's a mental dissociation. They're saying, I'm not here. I'm not a real person. Yeah. And uh, it's powerful. Uh, the part, of course, society says, oh, it, 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 you know, it's the words I use. It's not how I say it, you know. But we all know it's that the, the people that... We know that the people we trust are, you know, they, we probably like their words as well, but they have an ability to convey it with prosody. The paradox is prosody actually carries a, uh, a truthfulness, an acute truthfulness of the physiological state of the other. So it's not the easiest thing to tell a person to be more prosodic. What you're really saying to them be a safer person, be calmer in your body, take a few breaths. Because if we understand where intonation and vocalizations, where it came from, it came from mammals conveying to each other in the very primitive mammals that they were safe enough to come close to. If Mm. you're going to mate and you're not going to fight, how do I know? Well, I know through your vocalizations. And in fact, you know, that's really how we made as well. We made through, you know, social interaction, which is also primarily vocalizations until the internet. And, uh, you know, but, but the, you know, the mission, the issue was our bodies need to hear the voice of another to feel safe in their presence. Now, when we start talking that way, we start uh, getting issues of what if you're deaf, uh, what if you're, you're mute? And the issue is there are other channels. And, but the, to get those channels, if we even think about people who sign, if the signing is raised up so that people can look at faces, it becomes more effective. Ooh. So if the signing is away from the face, it would be like someone not talking to you directly. So the issue is, we, are, we, we need the cues, right? So when you turn your head, just like Dan said, uh, say no, no, or whatever, yell at, the, yell at your audience, not a good thing to do. But also if someone asks you a question and you do this and they say, I'm asking you a question and they say, well, I'm listening to what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. like your body's telling me difference. <laughs> well, for some people, they may. They may be so overwhelmed that they, to process the information, they have to kind of, get out of the setting. Uh, But the cues back are cues of this. 
being pushed mm-hmm. away. Yeah. Like I'm not safe. Dr. Porch, just as you're talking, I can't help but think about uh, Gottman's research mm. and you're talking about mating. And as a couples counselor, like that is a big, um, that intimacy, emotional, physical intimacy continuum is something that a lot of couples struggle with in the bottom three floors of that sound relationship house that knowing each other's world, that fondness and admiration and turning towards like physically mm. turning towards those are the three floors that really support the intimacy. The polyvagal theory like explains it perfectly. Well, That's well, amazing. Thank but thank you. But let me also tell you that uh, John and I were very, very close friends when he, we were both colleagues at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. Oh, okay. From uh, the, that's say this part of the seventies and eighties, we were together. So we would talk, but I wouldn't. I didn't have polyvagal theory then, and he didn't have his his system work out either. But we were good friends, and and I really enjoyed his inte- his il- intelligence and his in a sense really good heart. So yeah, the the bit with polyvagal theory, my view is that it's everywhere, you know, it, and it, and that's why like whether you're an EMDR or uh, internal family systems or play therapy or yeah. play. Th- uh, What's the word? Uh, Theraplay. You know, whatever the systems are, they're all polyvagal because they're all about enabling the body to be safe enough to be in communication with another. Oh, that's so good. You even influenced how I set up my office because I remember you saying, like, we put these kids that struggle with. Um, mm-hmm like symptoms of ADHD, we put them in the front of the class for yeah. proximity and they have all these cues of danger. And I was like, do I want my couch in front of the window or should I put it in front of the wall? And I'm like, in front of the wall, because the window, there's some yeah. unknown there. Yeah. Walls are wonderful if you if you have hypersensitivities. In fact, you can just ask your, uh, let's say, more mature hypersensitive colleagues or friends where they want to sit in a restaurant. Mm. <laughs> they will tell you the same thing yeah, I, against, the wall. against the wall and then i'll be able to hear you when you're speaking i'll be able to process i'll be able to focus on your mouth movements and you hear you better so in a sense if my body's now in a safer place not vigilant i can hear you better oh that's so good it's like i have more bandwidth to be able yeah. You have more bandwidth because you are changing your physiological state. And in a sense, you're aware of what your nervous system needs. It's not any deficit on your part. It's an honoring of your own physiology. And we all benefit when people become aware of what their nervous systems need. And they're taken seriously by teachers and parents and spouses that their nervous system is now fragile. Don't say, ah, oh, that's nothing. I can just and they and you push them to the wall. They're they don't have the resource. And you have to, in a sense, trust the person who's saying, This is a little bit too much for me to handle. Oh, so good. Now, before we finish up, I want to just uh, touch on two things. I'm an SSP provider, which oh. is literally changed my work, especially with uh, you know, as it's um integrated with these EMDR sessions. Yeah. But also, I want to touch on recess. And I used to be a teacher, and I've seen this, and I know the desperation behind trying to um, have everything. But the the actual taking away, I feel myself getting activated even thinking about it, taking away recess as a punishment or a consequence. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you could guess my thoughts. I think... I think schools would be better served if they increase the opportunities for recess and movement with the one restriction that it should encourage social interaction. Yeah. And the problem is uh, basically we've turned into a culture of inputs and outputs or stimulus and responses. And the educational model is I give more opportunities for cognitive functions or cognitive tasks math, literature, whatever it is, I'm pushing it into this machine. And the more time I use to push it in, the more I'll get out. It neglects the importance of what's going on inside that machine, inside that nervous system. Just like we talked about being uh, prepared for surgery or interventions, we have to be prepared for learning. Our nervous system has to be in a physiological state that is not under a state of threat to be defensive, but a state of safety that leads to curiosity. 
Mm. and respect curiosity and the reward for discovery. And that's what learning is about. But what we ended up doing is taking those rewards of discovery and curiosity in the way we structure the educational model into a simple input output system without respecting the state that the child is in or the adult is in to take in that information. Uh, We just have a very naive uh, viewpoint of the human experience. And I think education uh, latched on to a behavioral model. So it was input and output. And then if behaviors are oppositional or acting out, they can be changed through reward and punishment. Mm. How effective has that been? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. That uh, and, of like and, setting out of recess is going to help make somebody finish their math when you know being immobilized. Yeah, and and the people aren't getting enough movement, uh, reciprocal movement, rhythmic movement. They're not in their bodies, mm-hmm. and this is you know the world of dance movement therapy. Over the years, yes, um, I start realizing that there needs to be a greater integration between movement, rhythmic movement and psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. Um, Even even the aspect of like the safe and sound protocol, which is really, if you go into the roots of what the acoustic simulation is, Mm -hmm. it's hyperprosodic vocalizations. So it's taking vocal music and putting computer algorithms that basically Mm -hmm hyper uh, amplify the prosodic nature uh, in a progressive way. Uh, So it's basically like being on a treadmill or lifting weights. You're basically challenging the system in a neural exercise. And in fact, you see uh, uh, some of the feedback that you get from clients is that they're exhausted just like they were if they were exercising because they're structures uh, specifically in their middle ear, which are little EDB muscles, that are linked to the extraction of human speech, they get challenged Mm -hmm. and they are fast twitch muscles and they fatigue very easily. And that feedback of fatigue is exhaustion. So you start seeing kids who listen to this and they're in a sense doing real well with it, they often get extremely exhausted. And it's quite remarkable because the actual physical stimulus Mm -hmm. is a filtering of basically off the shelf vocal music Mm -hmm. in which you're taking away sound. You're not putting sound in. So it's less energy, less acoustic energy than the initial song. And still that is what's triggering because the patterning of the intonation is like the mother calming the baby. Mm. You can't turn it off. It's wired into you. The interesting part is that if you carry the interesting part or the part that I learned so much from from the feedback is that when since I give talks in the in in the world of trauma frequently, people want who had who were trauma therapists want to try this with their patients or their clients. And what we found out is that for uh, not every but for some their adversity history when they have, when they have severe adversity history, and when they listen to these sounds of safety and trust, their bodies open up the ventral side. And the reaction to that is vulnerability. So the nervous system says, you know, I have to follow this rule. I am becoming safe, but then the interoceptive. So the neuroception says, I'm there. (laughs) <laughs> the neuroception says, I've been there and look what happened to me. Ooh, and so the feelings of being safe now have become associated with being abused. Ooh. And and what the nervous system, the higher level nervous system is, is the strategy is been there, not going there again, not going to let this happen again. The best way is everything is a threat. So now sounds of safety become triggers of threat. And the strategy of moving them out of that is very much like somatic experiencing a little bit, a little bit at a time where you develop an awareness of those feelings. And it's not, and the feelings can't be attributed to the therapist. Even the feelings can be attributed to, well, this is a little bit of of music I'm listening to. Wow. What, you know, it's a physical bit. Now I, I can't develop that protective narrative of blaming you. Yeah. It's my body reacting. And wow, what an interesting phenomenon. Yes, which that takes it to perception, right? I'm 
thinking with um, EMDR sessions, we have, we call it phase two when we do the safe place. And sometimes the fit, safe place kind of bottoms out. Mm-hmm. It's not safe to be safe, which is sounding yeah. like yeah. what you're describing. Exactly, exactly. But that and being with, I think, like you described the co-regulation, that seems to be the ticket and like little, but I have been doing the SSP but with highly complex traumatized individuals, I'll do 15 minutes, just see how they are. And then I'm right with them. We're like coloring together regarding age. That's yeah. But you're also allowing them to do something with it. So they're not like frozen, but the answer, you know, for some people, they just go fine. They can go through the half hour or an hour session. No problem. For some, they listen for two minutes yeah. And suddenly they're in a physiological state or they've experienced something viscerally that they haven't for decades and they can't handle it. Yeah. You know, their, their body reacts to it. It's really, uh, it, it tells you so much. So for me, when I get the feedback, I've learned a lot. I had a, actually a, a friend who's a psychiatrist who went through listening and we now have the SSP Connect, which is the same music without filtering it, it's to build familiarity, to oh. leverage neural expectancy so that uh, you know what the music li- uh, listens to and now you can really listen to it. Well, he had adverse reactions to just listening to the raw music. Oh, okay. So even though it was the connect without the filtration. Yes, and- yes, yes. Ah. So what did that tell me? That told me there was something in his history, something back. And what's now interesting is um, he he had another disruption. He got COVID and then he had some surgery and he's not doing well. So in a sense, his body um, wasn't tuned. Uh, his appearances and his presentation of himself was yeah. that, you know, he's almost like a super person. But the reality was he was carrying vulnerabilities and listen, the reaction to the music was the flag to me, not to the rest of his world, but to me that there was something there yeah. that needed to be, needed a lot of, let's use the term, self-compassion and self-care. And what a lot of people do is when it comes to themselves, they push that aside and say, I don't need it, mm-hmm. but I'll help others. And that's, you know, we have to, and as therapists during the pandemic, this becomes a real issue of where are you and your colleagues getting the co-regulation that you need? Oh, that's so good. The importance of self-care, self-regulation seems so different than the experience when you had surgery, how your body was t- uh, tuned. Dr. Porches, I could literally listen to you all day. <laughs> You're like the, the smartest person I've ever met, um, but we're almost out of time. I want to make sure people know where to go to find out more or learn more from you. Yeah. Well, I would suggest they go to uh, uh, polyvagalinstitute.org. It's okay. one world, one word. Polyvagal Institute is a new not-for-profit that we created where we're developing uh, educational materials for different areas. We don't have any courses yet for play therapy, but we would welcome a, a collaboration of developing that. So that's mm-hmm. something which some you know play therapists interested in developing courses, just contact me and I'll connect you with the CEO, uh, our, our director of our foundation. Uh, the other one is I have uh, my own webpage, stephenporches.com, and there are materials on both for people to down, download and to follow that. Um, I want to, before we move on, I want to really get into this real issue about schools, education, and recess. And and really the pressure on the school systems, the the superintendents, the teachers on structuring a curriculum that is devoid of uh, sufficient opportunities for movement and co-regulation, seeing it as something that is not important. And what I want people to think about as a take home is that sociality is a neuromodulator. What that means Mm -hmm. is it stimulates our nervous system and our social interactions are profound neural exercises and our bodies need it. And the pandemic has taught us a lot about it. It teaches us that the restriction of our social interactions, are, we, we basically feel very different. Our nervous system is retuning and we're retuning to a state that is more threat 
biased. We're more negative biased, more threat biased. Not that there isn't good reasons to be concerned, but through the history of humanity, whenever we've been under threat, we mitigate our threats through our social interactions. Mm -hmm. So if you take away from recess, you're limiting their academic yeah. performance substantially rather than adding. You're limiting how their nervous system becomes retuned uh, or it's retuning the nervous system to become less resilient, less dealing with uh, disruptions. So when you, you know, like talking about uh, John Gottman's program, it's really saying that if we retune our nervous system to be more threat oriented, our recoveries are going to be poorly done. We're going to have disruptions without recoveries. In the other model is every disruption deserves a repair and it becomes part of a way in which we become more bonded, and more related to each other. So disruptions are not necessarily negatives. They yeah. become triggers for reconnection and repairs. Oh, so good. Uh, gosh, it, it literally applies to every type of ther therapy that I've ever heard of. I mean, I'm thinking, I love, I don't know, my mind is going well, but thinking about you guys in the 70s before the sound relationship house, before the polyvagal theory, and hear how it all intertwines together. And yeah. how he talks about like, if you don't have friendship, your relationship yeah. is, you know, friendship is the glue that holds it all together. That's all what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. And through the lens of play therapy and play and schools and just it's not even that it's um helpful it's essential yeah well it, it's essential because it's part of who we are yeah. it's it's part of who we are as social mammals and we share this of course with dogs and cats and horses and we need to be respectful and learn from them as well they will ah. teach us yeah, as they show, as they give us our, their belly to rub. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Porch. So I'm going to put links below this video for okay. anybody watching that can, can uh, whether if you're a, a provider and you would like to um, become like uh, trained or certified in SSP, or if you would like to learn more about polyvagal, there'll be yeah. all kinds of links below. Yeah, and on my webpage, there's a, there's a link to go to Unite for the Safe and Sound Protocol <sighs> Training. I highly recommend it. It's changed my work. All right. Thank you. Right behind.